Good evening, everybody. It is great to see you this evening. My name is Stephanie Plunkett. I'm Deputy Director and Chief Curator here at the Norman Rockwell Museum, and uh, we're so happy you came. This is going to be a wonderful evening. I'd like to introduce you to some of our staff. This is Mary Burley, our Chief Educator. We have Margaret Hotchkiss, who oversees our communications, and Patrick O'Donnell, our wonderful educator, Tom Daly, also our Curator of Education here, and Laura Berliner, who oversees visitor services, and Rich Brackway, who is doing all of our um, technical work here. And so we're just happy that you are all here. So um, the program that we um, have prepared tonight is part of an ongoing series, which we call Four Freedoms Forums. And of course, uh, the forum concept and the Four Freedom concept is based in the art of Norman Rockwell. As some of you may know, uh, some of the jewels of the Norman Rockwell Museum's collection are actually his Four Freedoms paintings, which were uh, published in 1943 and inspired by Franklin D. Roosevelt's State of the Union Address, uh, where he was essentially laying out uh, a vision for a peaceful post-war world. And when we got to talking about this particular Four Freedoms program, we realized it might be interesting to talk about um, the concept of, as you see here, uh, the idea of can art actually change us and this notion of the transformative power of art. Uh, so in terms of Rockwell's Four Freedoms, what is very interesting about them and perhaps little known is that until his Four Freedoms were published, uh, President Roosevelt's Four Freedoms were little understood and it really took uh, the efforts of many artists, but especially Norman Rockwell, who was a beloved illustrator, to kind of help people see what protecting freedom could actually look like in people's everyday lives. But we're very fortunate here because we work with uh, the art of illustration, so published imagery that uh, has a very unique and direct connection to people. Um, and so tonight, we actually have some wonderful commentators who are going to speak from various perspectives on um, the ways in which art can affect change. And so Mary's going to give you some detailed background on them, but I just want to say uh, thank you so much to our wonderful speakers. We're so excited to have you. Uh, we have Alexandra Kennedy, who's the director of the Eric Carle Museum in Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, Jane Feldman, a very talented award-winning award photojournalist, um, who's also participating in our Traveling for Freedoms exhibition, which just opened in Washington, D.C. And of course, Melanie Mawinski, uh, who's a wonderful educator and artist, and uh, you'll hear a lot more about the three of these very talented people from Mary in just a minute. We thank you all for coming and enjoy the evening. Hello, everybody. As, as Stephanie said, we're just so happy that you're here. Um, I think what I'll do is introduce Jane and then um, Alex and then Melanie um, separately before their presentations, and then after each of them has presented, we'll have a wonderful conversation with them. Um, so Jane is going to start this evening, and she is an award-winning photojournalist <clears throat> and a former New York fashion photographer and producer whose dedication to human rights has led her to work on such international projects as Am Amnesty International, uh, to photograph Nelson Mandela, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and the Dalai Lama. Jane is the author of nine children's books from Random House, in addition to Jefferson's Children, the Story of One American Family. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Time, PBS's Frontline, CBS Sunday Morning, <coughs> the History Channel, and many more. Um, Jane works with clients in the Berkshires, New York City, and around the globe, and her photograph titled Freedom of Religion Reimagined is currently traveling with the Norman Rockwell Museum's e exhibition Enduring Ideals, Rockwell, Roosevelt, and the Four Freedoms, which Stephanie men mentioned just opened in Washington, D.C. So without further ado, Jane, welcome, and we're, we're so curious to hear what you have to say. Hi, good evening everybody. And um, I just, I, I wanna say it's always an honor to be back here at the Rockwell. Um, 
I have a long relationship with this place, and I, it's always an honor, seriously, um, to be part of the Four Freedoms that's traveling right now, to be here with other extraordinary artists, including in our audience, I might also have to mention tonight. So I started with this slide, not because it's a picture of me, but I started with this slide because uh, my world has always been diverse. Diversity is not a hobby for me. I grew up in a black and Puerto Rican neighborhood in New York City. I also grew up here in the Berkshires. I'm trying still to find balance in my world. I am happiest when everybody does not look the same. Sorry, Berkshires, but it's true for me. Um, and I still fight that. So these are some of my best friends, and that was in a studio uh, where I first worked. Um, I, I, I always loved photographing people, and my thought was to try fashion and advertising to find a way, but I also find it very pre prejudicial. Um, I fought the good fight to have black women doing work with Revlon, um, with diversity. We were diverse, but the models were not always. Casting-wise, this is still something that we're pushing, and the, the younger people do not know how much of a fight this really was. So um, it took a, something called the Black Girls Posse, which was a top uh, African-American female models to walk into Revlon and show them how much was missing by only having pink in a jar in their cosmetic world. So, okay, so that's my world. And um, this is a picture I'm probably most known for. Um, this was after the LA riots. Um, and I, I came out of fashion and advertising kind of dismayed. Um, I have to say the day that I left the industry was a day uh, I was working for a top client um, that you all know, but I will not mention their name this evening. Um, I walked into my dressing room and there was a uh, model 16 years old shooting heroin telling me that life sucked. And I said, I can't do this. I need to be able to create images that help inspire and not lead to a false sense of beauty, prejudice, and so forth. So this was immediately after the LA riots, and I started to work with the City Kids Foundation in New York City. Um, we had seen nothing but negative press, and I had the kids come up to the park and take terms being human symbols, which they were happy to do. Um, never planned on this being published. It has been ever since at your Barnes and Nobles and bookstores everywhere because people just responded again. Often as artists, we do this for ourselves out of need, but it's really an amazing factor when somebody else keeps responding, as you all know. So I did that. Um, so um, Mr. Kennedy mentioned tonight, my life has had a lot of crazy turns. So I started working with youth and, um, and trying to use the camera, uh, as Gordon Parks said, as a, as a weapon for good, to be able to put positive images out there. I went to the Human Rights Conference in 1993 with kids from around the globe. Next thing I know, I meet Jack Healy, one of the founders of Amnesty. He said, I like you, I trust you, women and children have no voice, we're going into the refugee camps together. I was ill-prepared. I had not ever, I took pictures of pretty people in safe places, but next thing I know, I'm in refugee camps at the height of the war. Changed my life forevermore. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures, only because it's about hope. And even in the midst of the crisis and insanity and trauma-ridden refugee camps, there is hope. Um, this is without hope. And this is, this was, uh, there were 37 women who had been systematically raped living in one room. Um, and I didn't even realize, again, we, I don't think we always know what is inside of us until we're pushed. There was a journalist, Canadian film crew, that tried to kick down the door to go in and get interviews. And I literally threw my body in front of the door and said, they've been traumatized enough. They'll tell you their stories. Be kind. And again, I didn't know I had that kind of warrior spirit, but it's an amazing thing when it comes flying out of you to protect others and try to tell their stories. I don't need to tell you who this guy is. Um, one of the greatest honors of my life um, was working for Riverside Church in New York City, and I was Mandela's last photographer in the United States, 2005. Um, I, my knees were buckling under me. I went through a month-long security clearance, <laughs> strip search three times, getting on planes that month before, but for him, all worth it. Um, and I have to say, there was part of the security clearance was to make certain that I would not use a flash because it's a little known fact, but he 
when he was on Robben Island, had just um, working on the chain gang. The rocks, the white rocks were so reflective that it burned out his retinas. So um, what was left of his sight would be taken away completely by the flash going off, which of course I would not be responsible for. Um, here he is. Um, uh, you can recognize a few other people, his best buddy there. Uh, this was just an incredible, incredible evening and a huge honor. I didn't realize till about 10 years later that I would be working with his partner in crime, Desmond Tutu, who I'll also show you in a moment. Um, anybody recognize these folks? <laughs> just a few, right? Um, yeah, so um, we have Cornell and Michelle Alexander, and we know who's up front there, Ms. Davis. Um, I didn't realize that I was going to be hanging out with all these radicals, but, you know, I, I, I don't seem to mind. It's all good. Um, and I think part of being an artist, um, for me, it's been taking my voice when I didn't even know that I had that kind of statement to make and, and giving power to other voices. Again, the diversity thing for me is real. Um, in the 70s, I read a book by Fawn Brody, then a UCLA professor in California, um, and she wrote a book that I read, and I thought, wait a minute, the third president had two families? And I told all my friends, I was like, did you know that the third president had two families? And all my friends of color went, yeah. Mom told me, Grandma told me, you don't know this. So my fascination in how the discrepancies in how much has been, in fact, kept from us started then. Um, what I didn't know is I went down to Monticello with no press credentials and no money. I met this young man in the middle, very proud there, who is my co-author for Jefferson's Children. Um, it's kind of interesting to have you here this evening <laughs> talking about kids' books. Um, I went down to do a photograph for a book on the American family for Random House. They kept saying, give us a celebrity family. I didn't want to feed the celebrity machine. This family was more interesting. I went to Charlottesville with no press credentials and no cash in my pocket, met Shannon, who was 19 years old, who is a Madison Hemings descendant, and we rallied the family. It's a shot now seen around the world, um, not just mine. Also, there was the world press there that day. Um, I left the mountain shaking because of what I had witnessed. I called, I figured since we broke all the rules that were ready to break, I called the I called the senior vice president at Random House at home on Saturday night, which I don't recommend, by the way. But she said, you're who, you're where, you met who, what? Proposal Monday by noon. And we had a deal within 48 hours, which also does not happen. But I really believe that when the truth is ready to be told, do not stand in the way. So, so this was Jefferson's children. And we're almost, we're approaching 20 years this May and a big reunion coming up. So rather highly symbolic family. Um, this is Jill Sim. Again, this is where the power of the photograph is amazing. Uh, Jill Sim self-identified as other, as a small child, which her mother never understood because they were white and her grandparents were white. And, but Jill, as a 20-year-old, went on a search to find her great-grandmother, who is Anita Hemings, right there, now very proudly the first recognized as the first black graduate of Vassar. Um, she passed for white. It was a national scandal. They almost didn't, they almost kicked her out. Um, her brother, Frederick, was one of the first black graduates. This is again 1905. Um, Frederick was an MIT student. Uh, MIT had been accepting blacks at that point. And you can just see how genes play out, you know? <laughs> Actually, I think the reason I did this in black and white is if you stare at Jill's face, she looks more like Frederick. Look at the jawbone, look at the, the features. You can see past the color. So um, this is Shannon, my co-author. He was only 19 years old when we met and started this amazing journey with some serious questions for a great, great grandpa. Still asking him, by the way. Um, this is Dan Hemmings. Daniel Hemmings was raised a racist in very rural Virginia. Um, that is his brother's Confederate flag ghosted out in the background. Um, Danny came to Monticello hoping to find out who he was, who his relatives were. And, uh, and was embraced and had, no, I had never felt such unconditional love. And so he, his journey was part of learning that racism can also be untaught. And when I told him about wanting to use, when I asked him about wanting to use the picture in the book, I said, Dan, this could, could be dangerous for you. He lives in rural Virginia. And uh, 
I said, I won't do it if it could put you at risk. And he said, you know, some things are worth dying for, Jane. Go for it. That's courage. And this is Shannon and Chandra and their two little kids. There's now three of them going back to Mulberry Row and teaching them where they come from. I love that picture. And then we get to these guys. So, again, it's kind of weird. I mean, how I got from fashion and advertising to work with, like, spiritual leaders. And, um, but that is what happened. And um, Archbishop Tutu uh, and his best friend, the Dalai Lama, um, traveling with this was on a, um, a multi-face panel that we did in um, Seattle, Washington. And um, one of the stories I just have to share really quickly, I traveled with Archbishop for over 20 years. And what people don't really understand is, yes, technically it's important to be a good photographer, but part of the deal, I think for me, in working with people like this, in working with the indigenous community, is trust. Um, it is as important to know when not to shoot as when to shoot. I try to tell kids that these days just because they got a phone and they can post, they think it's okay. And I'm like, no, it's a recording device. Is it, is it okay within this culture? Are you, are you robbing someone of their soul? Is any shot worth that? You know, and um, so it's a process. But in this picture, I just have to say, um, this was a moment of prayer and silence and the beauty of them together is really this. They're very serious when they need to be serious, but they are two of the funniest people you'll ever meet in your life. And um, they had just addressed this huge, huge audience in Seattle. And a 17-year-old kid stood up and said, hey, you know, I don't understand. I've been watching you guys tickle and high-five and love each other. Like, how does this work? Your religions are so different. And they both like giggled and high-fived again. And, um, and Archbishop said, yeah. Our religions are different, but our faith is the same. We believe in kindness and compassion. And I wish the world press had run the story, but at least I'll tell the story as often as I can. There they are. So, um, I have also done a lot of work with the indigenous community. Again, I'm not sure how all this worked. I've been working with the Native American community, many, many different tribes since I'm about 24. This is Grandmother Flor de Mayo, who is... Uh, Mayan, from, originally from Nicaragua, and um, this is at her place now in, in New Mexico. And I have to say, again, part of it is trust, knowing when not to shoot. I will never shoot ceremony. I will never pull out a piece of equipment. That's like goes without saying. Um, and yet, at the same time, out of respect, there's a, this beautiful understanding that happens, and people want you to share who they are. Oh, that's Grandmother Flor de Mayo. She's also, if any of you follow the documentary on the 13 original grandmothers that all awaken to the same dream worldwide about the urgency that we're all feeling, <laughs> she's one of them. And they, they met with the Dalai Lama. They went to India. They all went to each other's different communities. All, this was not just Native Americans. These are indigenous people from Africa, from Asia, um, from Central America, all over, and they went and taught each other about their medicines. Pretty amazing stuff. So, okay, so here we have uh, Mary and Percy. We have both, um, we have both, now my brain's going, um, Ojibwe, as well as Hopi. And this was at the Climate Change March in New York City, and we did a little prayer service in Central Park prior. Um, Many of the grandmothers have become these like unbelievable activists right now, and they're all they're all being told like of the urgency, and they're trying to find their way too, with honestly with white culture, um, because they feel some of the medicine is is necessary to share, but you know it's a delicate balance, and uh, again I'm just like insanely honored to be in their presence. And this is Mary meeting Chief Warren Lyons, who is here from the Mohawk Nation as well. Um, <laughs> this was out in New Mexico. Uh, this is uh, Grandmother Unchirita in the middle. She's 93 years old. And again, the humor. I, I, I keep getting hit with the humor thing, like do the serious work, but remember, it's, life's pretty funny, you know? Um, and there she is letting us know about that. She comes from the poorest reservation in the United States. 
Any, anybody have any idea where that is? Um, it could be Navajo. It's actually Lone Pine. And um, so, yeah, um, there are several. Navajo, when I was out at Navajo, I was shocked, and I feel like any time I get a chance to speak publicly, it's essential to say 40% um, of the Navajo reservation is currently without any water. Any water. And those who have, it's usually pretty toxic stuff. So, yes, hello, America. We have work to do. Um, there she is, cracking everybody up. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, this is not just Native American. Um, we also have uh, two of our sisters from New Zealand. The Maori have come in and really been a very, very strong voice right now as well. So, there she is, 93. Check this woman out, would you? Amazing, amazing. So this is actually um, from a series that I did. Um, this was uh, not terribly far away from here, and I noticed some folks in the room tonight. Um, this, is, uh, this was done at the abode of the message, originally Sufi tradition. And this was after a universal worship, and everybody was dressed really beautifully, and we went on the herb garden, and I just, I, I love this picture. This is the picture that was chosen for freedom of religion. And again, this was after universal worship and everybody was hanging out and just laughing. And uh, when it was chosen, I was kind of surprised because I had some more kind of edgy political stuff. But everybody said, no, we wanted to see the humanity and the laughter and the beauty. And so I was like, I can live with that. So that is a picture that is traveling with freedom of religion. And that's kind of, that's a little bit of everything. Um, so thank you, Jane. That was wonderful to hear about your adventures. Um, and now we have Alexandra Kennedy coming up. Um, Alexandra is the executive director of the Eric Carle Museum of Picture Book Art in Amherst, Mass, a position that she has held since 2008. Uh, the many outstanding exhibitions and programs that she has led at the museum underscore the importance of li art, literacy, and children's books for all children and about all children. Prior to that, Alex served as vice president and editorial director at Disney Publishing Worldwide. Uh, during her 17-year career with Disney, she served as editorial director of US consumer magazines, which includes Family Fun and Wonder Time magazines. She was presented with the Disney Publishing Worldwide Leadership Award, the Launch Editor of the Year Award, and the Exceptional Women in Publishing Award from Women in Periodical Publishing, to name a few. So welcome, Alex. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you, Stephanie, for having me here today. Um, for all of us who care about illustration, this place is just a remarkable treasure, and we are all indebted to all the work that happens here on behalf of American Illustration. So it's my pleasure today to talk to you about a conversation that's happening in the children's book community and that is very much on our minds at the Eric Carle Museum, and that is the need to diversify children's literature so all children can see themselves in books. Impassioned debates about representation, about what story gets told and who gets to tell it, are happening all around us in all art forms as we wrestle as a society with the ongoing racism and prejudice in our culture. What could be more fundamental to address than the books we give to our children? The debate around the representation of people of color in picture books goes back as far as the first picture books. Some of that Discussion is focused necessarily on the many and deeply offensive portrayals of people of color by white authors and artists. The other part of the conversation where I'm going to focus today is on the paucity of books by people of color that have gotten published, as well as the dearth of characters and experiences that show life outside of white culture. Why is whiteness so often the default? I'm going to zoom us forward in children's book history and start with a seminal moment in 1990 when Rudine Sims Bishop, now Professor Emerita of Education at Ohio State, published an impassioned case for the creation of books that act as both mirrors and windows, a rallying cry for its time and a metaphor still in use today. Bishop argues that books can be mirrors reflecting back to us who we are, something that is critical in every developmental experience in, in the development for every child. As you can see on the screen, Literature transforms human experience and reflects it back to us. 
And in that reflection, we can see our own lives and experiences as part of the larger human experience. Books, Bishop argues, can also be a window onto the world around us, helping children learn about people who are different than they are, fostering empathy and curiosity. What happens when children of color can't find themselves in books? What message does that send about how they are valued by society? What happens when white children only find people who look like themselves in books? What lesson do they learn from that? In 2014, two decades after Sims wrote her groundbreaking article, with the landscape of children's books still remarkably unchanged, two op-eds appeared in the Sunday Times. Authored by two illustrators, the late Walter Dean Myers and his son Christopher Myers, they ask, where are the people of color in children's books? This apartheid of, of, this apartheid of literature, says Christopher Myers, and I'm going to condense here a little bit what he writes, this apartheid of literature in which characters of color are limited to the townships of occasional historical books that concern themselves with the legacies of civil rights and slavery, but are never given a pass card to traverse the lands of adventure, curiosity, imagine, or, imagination, or personal growth, has two effects. One is a gap, Meyer goes on to say, in the much written about sense of self-love that comes from recognizing oneself in a text, from the understanding that your life and lives of people like you are worthy of being told, thought about, discussed, and even celebrated. I believe that that is important, but I wonder if this idea is too adult and self-concerned, he asks. The children I know see books less as mirrors and more as maps. They are indeed searching for their place in the world, but they are also deciding where they want to go. They create through the stories they're given an atlas of their world, of their relationships to others, of their possible destinations. Soon after the op-ed pieces appeared, a panel of superstar authors and artists, four white men, were billed as the main attraction at a publishing conference, and a revolt began on social media. The novelist Ellen O. responded with a Twitter campaign, We Need Diverse Books, that quickly got more than 100,000 tweets. Soon after, We Need Diverse Books transformed itself from a social media phenomenon into a nonprofit advocating for a fundamental change in publishing. Other nonprofits and bloggers followed suit. Some that had been there a long time got the overdue attention they deserved. The publishing conversation began in earnest to meet the challenge of diversifying children's books, and that includes race, of course, but also LGBTQ+, gender diversity, the differently abled, and ethnic culture and religious minorities. The Cooperative Children's Book Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison has tracked racial diversity in children's books for more than two decades. The numbers, as you can see from this chart created by the publisher Lee and Lowe, are finally gaining. In 2017, 31%, that last bar on the right, of the children's books created were by and or about people of color and native people, the highest year on record since studies began in 1994 helping to bring up the average to 13% over the course of the 24-year study. Unfortunately, the number of books created by people of color has not kept pace. Last year, black, Latinx, and native authors combined wrote just 7% of the new children's books published. It's important for us to remember, too, as we look at this chart, where the de demographic trends are going in the US. The chart shows the population now at 30% people of color. 37% people of color. Within the next five years, though, more than half of everyone under 18 will have at least one parent who is not white. That 31% number, the bar on the right, needs to continue to grow. As you can see from this next Lee and Lowe chart, the publishing industry itself lacks diversity. 79% white, 78% female, 88% straight, and 92% not differently abled. More people of color need to be at all levels of publishing, and more young people of color need to see publishing as a viable career. We need bigger pipelines. Only when the industry behind children's books becomes diverse will we revolutionize the books that get published. One of the truisms in publishing for decades was that there isn't a market for more diverse books, that there aren't enough buyers for them. In 2015, Nielsen, the research people, conducted a study of children's book buyers. 
As you can see from this chart, the first column is the percentage of the overall book buyer pool, and next column is the index, which shows where they fall on an index of 100. So I'm quoting Nielsen here. Women under the age of 45 are the primary purchasers of children's books, and the non-white ethnic groups, particularly Hispanics, are more likely to buy than the general public. Hispanics make 14% of all children's book purchases and are 27% more likely to purchase children's books than the general population. So here's a sampling of recent titles that fall under the multicultural label. These recent titles, all garnering excellent reviews, many of them major award winners, reflect some of the headway being made in publishing. They were created by authors and artists, both white and people of color, and have a variety of stories, some relevant to the experience of people of color, like dreamers, and some with universal themes, like when's my birthday. The conversation about the content of children's books like these and who writes them continues, and sometimes they are very difficult conversations. This is a fine dessert from 2015, written by Emily Jenkins and illustrated by Sophie Blackall, both very successful children's book creators. In the story, the author traces the history of the dessert Blackberry Fool from 18th century England to the modern day. Along the way, the story stops at a plantation in South Carolina where a mother and daughter, both enslaved, prepare the dessert for their owners. After the mother and daughter serve a feast to the plantation owners, they hide in the closet to lick the dessert bowl. Initially, the book got rave reviews, but then questions started arising on social media, and soon the book had set off a firestorm. Here's one example of the response the book got. I've taken it from a New York Times piece about the controversy. Quote, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education, who has studied how school children respond to books about slavery, called the scene degrading and said that the book, whose subtitle is Four Centuries, Four Families, One Delicious Treat, suggest a misleading equivalency between the enslaved family and the others. Publishers are not thinking enough about who is reading these books, she says. Imagine reading a fine dessert to a classroom in Philadelphia that is 90% African American. How are these kids going to feel? In the end, author Emily Jenkins posted an apology, quote, I have come to understand that my book, while intended to be inclusive and truthful and hopeful, is racially insensitive. I own that and am very sorry. For lack of a better way to make reparations, I donated the fee I earned for writing the book to We Need Diverse Books. The self-examination across publishing has continued, with many more books scrutinized and many more programs reconsidered, many more than I can cover here. Two of note, last year the Association for Library Service to Children named the, uh, changed the name of the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award to the Children's Literature Legacy Award. They were prompted by concerns about Laura Ingalls Wilder's racist depictions of Native people and of African Americans. The ALSC explained the decision this way. Although Laura Ingalls Wilder's work holds a significant place in the history of children's literature and continues to be read today, ALSC had to grapple with the inconsistency between Wilder's legacy and the association's core values of inclusiveness, integrity, and respect, and responsiveness through an award that bears Wilder's name. In 2017, the National Education Association moved away from Dr. Seuss for their anchor Reading Across America program following the publication and debate around the book was The Cat in the Hat Black, The Hidden Racism of Children's Literature and the Need for Diverse Books. The NEA decided instead to focus on a variety of, diver of diverse books. More scholars are looking through the lens of race as well as gender, sexuality, religion, and other themes to try to create a truly multicultural library for children. It's vital, as we've seen, to consider who is telling the story, who has the, who has the authority, but it's also to con critical to consider what story is being told. Many critics have noted the large percentage of children's books that depict African Americans in terms of the history of slavery and civil rights and this is just a small sample of, of some of them. It's critical, of course, that our children, children of all races, learn about the horrors and realities of slavery. But it's also true that the African American experience should never be reduced to one story. We need stories about all people that include the complexity, beauty, pain, and passion that make up their lives. At the Carl, we're trying to educate ourselves staff-wide about the complex issues that created such a white-dominated children's literature in the first place, as well as the complex issues that we need to tackle in order to create a rich, vibrant, new, diverse children's literature. 
We're beginning to assess all areas of our work, including audits of our collections, both books and art, to understand how we can advance those collections to make them a powerful tool for an ever-increasingly heterogeneous society. We started working with a really good national nonprofit in Amherst called Embrace Race, so together we can help the parents and teachers who come to the car all learn to have thoughtful and honest conversations with children about race. I'd like to end with a short film, it's two minutes long, from a recent uh, opening event for Our Voice celebrating the Credit Scott King Illustrator Awards, an exhibition we had on loan from the National Center for Children's Illustrated Literature. We had more than 100 award winners and honors, the biggest collection ever assembled. For the talk at the opening, illustrator Jerry Pinckney, a great friend of the Carl and a great friend of the Norman Rockwell Museum, led a discussion with Equa Holmes and Gordon James, the two most recent Coretta Scott King winners. They capture beautifully the power and importance of books for all children. Great, thank you. beauty of a show like this is that you see so many different approaches to storytelling, which is what we're really doing. These books are going into all the libraries. Not every book gets to go in all the libraries. And so these CSK books get to go in all the libraries, so all children all over the country get access to those books, and I think that's really important. It's children's literature, those were my first galleries, those pages. That's when I learned to love art, was looking at the watercolor sketches and the drawings that I saw in children's literature. For a hundred years after we leave this planet, there'll be a child that's picking up crown and saying, that's my story, or picking up, you know, stuff of stars and saying, oh, that's how I'm wonderfully made. I was very proud to do crown. I have a little boy. Um, uh, one of the things that the author, Derek Barnes, has said about that story is that, you know, he had hoped it would help to humanize little black boys. And I think that the great thing about that story is that, you know, it, it kind of happens to star a little black boy, but it could really be about anyone. Children deserve real artwork. Some of the books that I read when I was a kid were my first exposure to, like, academic drawing and painting, which is kind of that thing that I love doing. And so, like, I want to create those books that maybe some kid will be like, oh, I just want to paint for the sake of painting. I like to hear what their story is, what story they have drawn from the artwork. Looking at artwork is a very personal experience, it's very subjective. And I think that's why we can learn a lot about each other from looking at art and talking. And thank you. Um, Melanie Mowinski is an artist, poet, and educator living in the Berkshires. In 2011, Mowinski founded Press, Letterpress as a public art project, a hybrid gallery, teaching, and studio space. From 2013 to 2015, Press served as one of the downtown hubs for students from the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, um, where, where Mowinski is a professor of art. She received an MAR in Religion and the, Visual Art and the Visual Arts from Yale University in 1999, where she was the Katsuo Miho Scholar in Peacemaking. She earned her MFA in Book Arts print and Printmaking from the University of the Arts, UArts, in Pennsylvania in 2006. Directly inspired by the statement, Liberty and Justice for All, she completed the 50 Card Project, a year of letterpress cards printed every week from Presidential Inauguration Day to the end of 2017. And I'm, I'm kind of proud to say that I'm one of the 65 people who signed up for that randomly at the time and enjoyed every postcard so much. Um, and I think you're going to show us a few of them today. So. Uh, last summer, she created an inspirational outdoor installation for the Norman Rockwell Museum, which was enjoyed by thousands of visitors. So welcome, Melanie.
Thank you very much for inviting me to be here. I'm so excited to, to see all of you and honored to be back at the Norman Rockwell. As Mary said, you um, may recognize me or maybe you recognize my work. Um, this was one of the pieces that I had here this summer. Paper words call attention to trees and inspire pause, reflection, and consideration of these beings. The chosen words focus on the positive aspects of trees as a reminder of how important they are for our survival. So these are a few of the images that I had here at the Norman Rockwell, and they were surprising for some. You, would, you weren't necessarily expecting to walk down a path and see these pieces. And that was a big part of why I first made these. I first made these in 2005 when I was at the University of the Arts. And here's a picture of me making these paper words. I like process. I like things that take a lot of time where you can settle into the work and the work becomes almost like a meditation. And so not only was I making each one of these letters and these words, this is a paper making process where you can see the... Um, the slurry of the pulp that I pulled, and what I'm doing is I'm putting one piece of paper on top of another piece of paper pulp where there's string inside of it, so the string is sandwiched inside of it. So it's a fancy stencil making process with paper. And I've installed this piece in quite a few places. So I had an artist residency in Tasmania, so this is um, the piece in, this is one of the words in Tasmania. I spoke about the project in, um, at a convention, at a conference in Tennessee. Here it is as part of Riverfest here in Williamstown. Or I think that was in North Adams, I'm not sure. I'm thinking Williamstown, I live in Williamstown now, and so I keep thinking about that place. And here it is on the Clark Trail. I had an artist residency in um, Nebraska City in Nebraska, where is the home of Arbor Day. And one of the reasons why I wanted to be there was to do this installation there. So this is in the Arbor Day Foundation Park. I thought this was a, a lovely kind of combination. I am really, though, committed to words, text, and language, and the power of them, and how they can be used to spark conversation, spark change, spark you to think maybe differently about something because of those words. As Mary said, for a number of years, I ran a project called Press, Letter Press is a public art project on Main Street North Adams. And one of the things about Press that was really, in some ways I'd say it's, it was our gimmick, but it was also this thing that I love to do, is every opening we would have six to eight exhibitions a year, and at every single one of those openings we made a, a monthly mantra card. And we didn't really make it. What you see here are people who are standing next to our letterpress machine. So this is a 2,500 pound machine that, um, with little pieces of metal and wood type that we would change. And you, the visitor, would come to our opening and print the last layer and then take that card away with, away with you. So here are some of the examples of some of the cards that we made during those five years. And you'll notice that you know, we never underestimate the power of enthusiasm. That was one of the first cards I made as part of this project. The kind of criteria for them where they had to be positive, maybe a tiny little bit cheesy, something you would put on your, your refrigerator or somewhere. And one of my favorite moments was someone who, who took a stack of these cards and she came in a few, a few weeks later and she's like, you know, I took a stack of those cards and I gave them out to people on the bus and they really loved it. And this is what the, like, this was the thing about these. They were free. We didn't, I never wanted to charge any money for them. I wanted them to be these moments of, of light and love that were distributed into the world. And one thing that should be really, should know, be known about everything that I do is I never do anything by myself, ever. I always have at least one to four students helping me along. Sometimes they're a direct assistant, sometimes they're part of a class. Um, these are some of the, the students who have helped me over the years in, with the Press Project, and some of them still continue to work with me. So Press was on Main Street in North Adams until 2015 when we moved to MCLA's campus where, we're, where the work I did with that public art project is now really woven into the teaching that I do at MCLA. But I also have this thing called Press on the Move. And it's this little mobile press, and here are two of my, my former students working with, working with it. Where we, t we would take it out into the community. We still do this. We take it to places on MCLA's campus. We take it to Mass Mocha. 
We've taken it to a lot of different places. And again, doing that same thing, making a card that you can make and take. You, you learn a little bit about letterpress, and then you go out into the world and you have this, this piece of, of memory. And I, I, I want to talk a little bit about this person, because this is Sister Corita Kent. Does anybody know Sister Corita's, Corita Kent's work? Is this a, a familiar image to any of you? So I see a lot of nodding. So this is in Boston, and this is Corita Kent. So Corita Kent was a nun. She was initially, she was teaching it at, in Los Angeles in the late 60s, early 70s. She eventually moved to, left being a nun, and moved to Boston, and Harvard owns her papers, and she, she died in, I think, on Cape Cod. And so I feel this connection with her for many reasons. One, because she ended up living in this state, but two, because of the way that she used text and image. She was very political, and she would take these images from popular culture. Like, what does this remind you of? Wonder Bread? Exactly, Wonder Bread. And so it's really hard to read the text that's in here. And so I have it, and I'm going to read it to you. It's from Albert Camus, and it says, Great ideas, it has been said, come into the world as gently as doves. Perhaps then, if we listen attentively, we shall hear amid the uproar of empires and nations a faint flutter of wings, the gentle stirring of life and hope. Some will say this hope lies in a nation, others in a man. I believe, rather, that it is awakened, received, nourished by millions of solitary individuals whose deeds and work every day negate frontiers and the crudest implications of history. As a result, there shines forth fleetingly the ever-threatened truth that each and every man, on the foundations of his own sufferings and joy, built for all. So she would do this. She would take pieces of popular culture and pair them with the writings of, of politicians, philosophers, and other notable people in the world. Here's an example of, of some of the different works that she did. You can see that she, she played around with a lot of different ways of using typography. So she's this hero of mine. She has been for many, many years. And so if you think about... I love, these, I love these mantra cards. I love making these things that I give, out, give, that give light and love to the world. And then this happens. And um, you know, I, teach at a, I teach at a state college, and I have a lot of um, diverse students in my, in my classroom, and I remember them coming in the next day and, and really working with them to process what, what happened from all sides of it. And, and it was a really great conversation of people wanting to stay open-minded, giving Donald Trump a chance, people terrified for their life. And really, we had a lot of different conversations about this, and we decided to make this in response to it. So we took that little press on the move, we took it to the campus center, and the next week there was a rally really designed to try to, try to bring the students together to try to find a way that how can we do, how can we use love as a way to unite us all? And um, this became this, this, this touchstone for me, this phrase. And then Shepard Ferry created this series. Some of you may know this. He did this right up, right before the inauguration day. And if you don't know Shepard Ferry, you probably might know this image. Shepard Ferry is, is, is another one of these icons for me, someone who's really doing this, what Ai Weiwei says. If someone questions reality, truth, facts, it always becomes a political act. Everything is art, everything is politics. Prior to, to Donald Trump being elected to president, I don't know if I would have said that my work had anything to do with politics. And even, even right after, I wasn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be sure. But then I made this card, and so we, know, we all know this phrase. So again, at MCLA, we do a lot of, we do a lot of these rally things at MCLA. We did this rally, um, on Inauguration Day, and I decided that I was going to print this. This is how I was going to honor that day. And so there were students and faculty coming through the, the press studio, and we were printing these and giving them away. And by the end of it, I think with this card, there's three different colors. We used two different presses to make this, this um, print. I think I made a 150, maybe 200 of these cards. By the end of it, I knew that I wanted to do this every single week. I wanted to respond to something that was happening that week and send them to Donald Trump and send them to people in his cabinet and then send them to other people. And I was going to do a Kickstarter and, I would, and whatever. And so I decided to do this in, that night. 
and I put it all in motion. But a lot of my friends were like, do you know what you're doing? I'm like, I know what I'm doing. And um, I had recently also created a piece about um, the statement liberty and justice for all, and I've been really thinking hard about the, the Pledge of Allegiance and how we, were all, we have all been taught to say that, and what does it really mean, and do we really live from that place of liberty and justice for all? So I embarked on this adventure of every single week, I made 100 letterpress cards, and I sent them, as Mary said, I sent them, there were 65 people who got them every single week, and then the remaining cards have been placed into different collections across the country um, as, as complete sets. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through just a, a few of them and, and tell you a little bit about them. I thought this was an appropriate one to keep because this seems to be a problem that we're still dealing with. This one says we build too many walls and not enough bridges. And this, I made this in response, to, this is week number two, in response to Trump's first announcement of building the wall. This next one is my favorite one, and this is a page spread from, I made a, a book of all the cards, and this is the, the page spread from one of them. And um, this one, the, what was happening this week is Trump fires FBI director James Comey, and Republicans propose a health care bill. And, but the thing that was really important this week, what was happening in my life, is that John Lewis had been the commencement speaker at MCLA, and he said something that was really important. And I don't know why I didn't make this card, but for whatever reason, I, I didn't. But he said, get out there, get in the way, get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble, and make some noise. And so this felt like an appropriate response. I'm no longer of the opinion that, I am no longer of the opinion that one can simply be a bystander. The next one that I have to show you is, I made this one in response to the congressional shooting in Virginia. You may remember that with uh, the baseball games. Um, this one was something to celebrate Pride Month and wanting to express the, um, the ease of giving people their rights, respect, freedom, and without repression. I think what was happening in my notes, what was happening that week, is it was Trump was pretty, very uncivil in his tweets that week, and they're insulting various people, and this felt like a way to try to counteract that. This week was when we first learned about John McCain's brain tumor, and the skinny repeal in health care was starting to um, ignite some more, and there was more smoke about Russia and Jared Kushner and Donald Jr. with Russia. This was right before the vote about the skinny repeal in health care. And I've, in many ways, this feels like this keeps coming back to me. This change happens by listening, 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 and then starting a dialogue with the people who are doing something you don't believe is right. Jane Goodall. What if we all did that? What would happen? This next one always gives me goosebumps when I um, look at it because I started making this, this card in response to the uneasy, uneasiness between North Korea and the rest of the world. And I had, print, I had printed the pink and the white, I had set the type, I think I had already print always in gold. And, um, and then Charlottesville happened, and Trump's response afterwards. And I finished printing this on Monday, and we all know what he said. So it, it, it just really made me, um, it, crazy, because what the little text says, which you might not be able to read, it says, neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes I would turn to social media. So this card I made in response to, Char to, the, to, the, to Trump's response to Sh Charlottesville. I made this in response to Trump's response to Charlottesville. And I didn't know which one to, which quote to use. I felt like the Ruth Bader Ginsburg, at that point I felt that was too violent. I don't know why, because right now that doesn't feel too violent, but somehow at that point it did. So I asked social media, I posted it to my Instagram page, and overwhelmingly everyone voted for Malala. Overwhelmingly. And I think they had one who, who voted for RBG. I don't know how that would be today. I I'm kind of would like to do that, that um, test again to see what would happen. I, um, th I made this after Las Vegas. And this is, Diane Feinstein had made these remarks, enough is enough. And my husband c couldn't stop thinking the song by um, Pete Seeger, when will they ever learn where have all the flowers gone? And so I decided to put the two of these together. Here's all 50 of them. It's, it's kind of a striking, 
uh, page to see them all together. And again, like I said before, I never do anything by myself. I had a student intern who worked with me the entire time. I had a couple students who, there were a couple weeks where I was traveling who did the cards for me. I ended up making a book about the project, and uh, which has a description of, of what was happening each week as well as the image of the, of the picture. And I still bring this work into what I do at MCLA. On um, the anniversary of an inauguration, there was this big art action day that was across the country, and so I decided to do this with some of my students. And so a group of them came and we, we painted a number of paper backgrounds, and then there's a, a, this kind of quick letterpress thing that we can do where they all make um, their own phrases and we printed them on top of these colorful backgrounds. And this ended up becoming part of the exhibit I had of the 50 Card Project when I exhibited it at MCLA's Gallery 51. And I think that's just one of the key things I'd like to say is that, that what I like to do is, is, is bring students along with me, bring others along with me, and hopefully not only is the work having a life by those who, who receive it, but also the students who work with me, that they continue to do something in their own lives with the work that they're, they're doing. I want to leave you with this slide. I did eventually print something for that John Lewis said. And this is technically was a, uh, was a very challenging, not challenging, but a really fun print. You may notice that the N lines up in these letters. It's just with this, you know, those of you who are like geeks about like little spacing and typography and things can, can appreciate this. Part of this project was about me learning printing and learning how to print. But anyways, how I'd like to end is not one of us can rest, be happy, be at home, be at peace with ourselves until we end hatred and division. Thank you. Um, so I was very struck by the, uh, the desserts story and the picture that you showed us of the enslaved family, mother and daughter, in the <coughs> uh, closet there. And that it sounded like you were saying, so the children of color especially, that would, that would be very distressing to them and hurtful. And my question is, but it's truth. That is the way it would have happened. And the ones who should be feeling badly and who look bad are the wealthy white people who don't treat other people as human beings. And I just wasn't sure why. Well, I, she apologized, the author, and she wanted to be, you know, uh, not be seen as, as, as in ignoring people. But I still feel that was a truthful thing, and that would have been a teaching opportunity if a teacher had been reading that, to stop right there and ask the children how they felt about it and discuss that rather than having, having it be a negative thing. Yeah, the, um, it, it was kind of a fascinating story to watch um, play out because the book had been so well received. Um, and it was really debated. It wasn't as if there was one opinion about the book and about particularly that scene was, was uh, highlighted. Um, and there were a lot of people who saw that scene as a moment of humanity for this mother and child who obviously were being denied all of their own rights and liberties. Um, and there were other people who saw that as um, outside of any reality of what might have happened in that probably that mother would never have taken that kind of risk. Um, so there, was lo there, was a, there were interesting, it was fascinating to watch, it was very heated, it was coming at a very heated time because things were already getting talked about and people were um, getting very passionate. And it was interesting, too, to see that um, the debate didn't even fall across racial lines, that people, all different people had all different opinions. But like you said, I think one of the things that came out of that is everybody saw it as a teaching opportunity. And it was a teaching opportunity for children, but it was also a teaching opportunity for the entire community. And I really respected the artist and the author for, um, for also treating it as that kind of opportunity. I would like to ask each of you to talk about how your art and, and your personal transformation in connection with art that you're working with has manifested in your personal lives. Which I'm 
It's not an easy question, but I, but I have, I what I listen to and what I read is completely different than it was two, three years ago. I I my husband and I have different. We like have our own little book club in some ways, where we're 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 looking at different things and trying to challenge each other. I don't think that happened before I did this 50 card project. So in many ways I think that like for me and then and I think this has been read this has been written in a lot of places that the election of Donald Trump is actually causing creating a lot of positive change. It's causing people to stand up to think about things in a different way and change their own lives and in changing their own lives maybe there will be bigger change in other places. And, and that is where I keep thinking of. If I start with myself and I start with my students and I try to model a different kind of behavior and uh, be open to conversation and be reading things that are outside of my comfort zone and doing things outside of my comfort zone, then that is maybe one of the benefits of Donald Trump being elected. M my husband and I took a, um, the, the week after he was elected, we went to the Cheshire, Got Run Cheshire Rod and gun club to learn how to shoot, but largely because we wanted to cross the aisle. Cheshire is a largely Republican town, and we are, we are not, and it was this opportunity to try to cross the divide. We never would have done that. And that I could give you a How'd number of examples. Hmm? How'd that work for How you? How did that work for you? You know, it was, it was I think, and, and even listening to, to the other panelists tonight, is you don't know what anybody is and everybody has a story and if you listen and talk there's you there, you're going to find something that you can talk about there's a woman there was a woman on my street i was picking up trash and she stopped and we were talking and we we had a great conversation i realized that she was the woman who has the trump flag and we like continue to wave hi to each other and we talk to each other all the time we found something we can bond over picking up trash on our street and being mindful of that there are other things we don't, but I think that, for me, is, is we have to be open. There's so many ways to answer that question, and it's a really interesting question, so thank you. Um, I think right now, um, I have a 21 and 23-year-old son, and uh, a lot of young people on our staff who are really passionate about picture books and also really passionate about social justice, uh, as are my sons. And so I am just finding this um, a time where um, I just really need to learn to listen. And despite the fact that I'm 58, realize that there's still so much I've got to figure out. Um, and I've been, I hosted a couple of afternoon, we called them, um, we're doing strategic planning at the museum. And I, uh, I hosted happy hour strategic plans with hard cider in the afternoons and had these, what for me were such meaningful conversations because it's very easy, I think, as you get older to believe that you know and to believe that you've already figured everything out. And particularly, I think, when you're in a leadership position in an organization, people kind of count on you to have figured it out, but the real secret is that you, you know, you don't understand anything. And like what I'm, what I'm presenting tonight, I'm still learning that. I'm not an expert on that. I'm trying to figure it out. It's, I picked that topic in part to make myself have to sit down and try to put a timeline to something that's really important to me personally and is really important to the museum. Um, so not, not exactly a, an answer with the, gave you a beginning, middle, and end, but I guess I would say listening to what young people are grappling with right now and the incredible passion they have for the difficult things that are happening in our society and their desire to fix those is something that I really want to stay focused on. Listening is a huge part. I've always been an ally. I've always been a token white girl that shows up in any room. I don't know how it works, but it does. Um, but I'm listening better. And one of the things that I have learned um, is actually being an ally is great, but um, shutting up is also important. And I learned that from um, an organization called Coming to the Table that was founded by Jeffersons and Hemings and Balls and Harristons and people of mixed heritage that come down from slaveholder and slave, which again is part of the American story we don't know. You either come from slave or slaveholder. Guess what? The multitude of complexions that you see walking around is a result of both. America doesn't want to wrap her head around that. A lot of people were produced as workers. 
We have a lot of history that we haven't owned. I've learned so much in hanging out with people of color to hold back some of my passion and allow them to speak. Give them their voice as African Americans, as Native Americans. Um, I think also with young people, I try to empower as many artists as I can. You know, I, great, I'm the photographer, but I want to come back and next time see them be the photographer and the filmmaker and the painter and to give them their own voice um, was probably the single most significant thing. And again, I mean, I think um, I still don't say his name, <laughs> but since that guy went into the White House, um, yeah, there's a, there's a sense of urgency. Um, there's no doubt about it. And um, I think art and activism, you know, in, in many other cultures, you go into e Eastern Europe, they, they, they're, they're one. There's not this luxury item of doing aesthetic art just to be pleasing. And I'm feeling that as an artist myself, that it, it's got to be it's got to be one, and it comes from my heart. Making my art open to me so that I am able to hear and to see um, other artists' work and other people's, and hear other people's voices. Um, I'm, not <clears throat> I'm not as comfortable with the thought of going to the Cheshire Rod and Gun Club um, because I have associative problems with that. So I haven't done anything like that. But I do listen. I, I don't watch Fox News for the same reason. Politically, I am very much on the left side of the table. But I do listen. And I keep listening. As far as transformation, my path as an artist has been all about that. Um, it's hard for many people to, th I make jewelry, so it's hard for people to think of jewelry as transformation, but it is. It's the costume that we put on, and it transforms us, um, hopefully. Um, not everything is black and white. And I'm just very curious, this is a very specific question. In the world of children's book illustrations or just books that are being written, what about the Asian population? Um, I'm an artist, I'm a painter. I do, I do many things and I, I used to do a little bit in the world of film. I, I don't see so many books written for the Asian population just as we don't have enough wonderful actors, directors, et cetera, in the film business who are Asian. Is this changing or is... Y y all the way up to YA, I think you will see that there are a number of really um, important books out there now talking about the Asian American experience. At the Carl right now, we have an exhibition of graphic novels and we have Jean Lewin, Jean Lewin Yang's drawings from uh, American Born Chinese, which is a really groundbreaking book talking about that experience. Um, I know you all had Grace Lynn here about a week ago talking about her new book that just won an award. Um, I think they're all the same sensitivities too of, uh, like for all of us, is people not wanting to be thought of as just Asian or Asian American, but people having very specific heritages that they are still connected to. Some of them are still connected to languages. Um, and so those same conversations and, and debates are happening in the, in the children's book world around those kinds of topics. Um, and I, I am sure that the representation is still not what it needs to be, but I do think there's quite a bit there right now and, and a lot of artists getting really um, very good attention for the work that they're doing uh, coming out of um, different kinds of Asian American experiences. Um, and I, d I don't know if maybe there's a a little bit to say about how you've chosen what stories to tell. It is a combination of listening, but you're also each very determined um, about, your, about what you're choosing. I think, I think my experience is so different because I'm not an artist, so it's probably how I would approach that or think about that is, is a bit different. Um, I, I guess, I'm not sure this is quite answering your question directly, but 
for me, coming to the, to the Carl Museum and being able to work in something that was mission related was such an exciting opportunity. I got there and I said, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm not an expert in the children's book world. I'm, I'm you know, I've never run a nonprofit. I don't know that I can do this, but I really want to do this. And I uh, was very fortunate to have people who trust, entrusted me with that position. But it has been such a gift to me because the artists that are part of that community have been so open and sharing and so much wanting, just like you see here at the Rockwell, those artists want to see the museum succeed because they think of it as a place that values their work mm -hmm. and validates the importance of illustration, which for so many years illustration had to, uh, just did not get the respect that it should have gotten. So uh, anyway, for me, I guess my, uh, I have to look at it through more of a career lens, but that was my, that was my great opportunity, leaving the corporate world. As a friend, of, as a friend said when, um, Somebody said to her, why would Alex do this? Why would, why, would she, why would she leave a big job like that? And she said, so she could get her soul back. <laughs> but it worked. The, the role of courage. And I, I, n I never think of courage when I'm thinking about the things in my life, although I know other people look at my life and they're like, wow, you must have a lot of courage. And that never occurs to me. Um, what occurs to me usually is, wow, that looks like that would be fun. And um, I will never, I mean, I have two, two examples. I wanted to be a Peace Corps volunteer, and uh, I told my parents I wanted, to, I wanted to do this. I wanted to go abroad, and my, and my dad told me that it thought of me, and the Peace Corps made him want to throw up. And I, I didn't think he was serious about it. And my parents asked my sister, why do you think she wants to do that? And my sister said, I think she, because she thinks it's going to be fun. And that was why I did it. And it was hard. It was not <laughs> necessarily fun sometimes, but the, it was a piece, th that decision, I think, it gave me, cur it, 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 even if I didn't know I had courage, I was practicing courage even without even thinking about it every single moment that I was doing it. And I don't think I ever think anything through. I just think it's gonna be fun. <laughs> and so I do it, and then I discover what the challenge is, but I've already committed to it, and so I have to continue. So when I started press, the someone had given me a, this Vandercook, and I, was talking to one of my friends, I was like, well, you know, wouldn't it be good if I had a storefront, an empty sto storefront, I would bring it there and, and I, would, I would I would do something with it. I had no idea what that was. He said, well, there's a grant that's due tomorrow. If you apply for it, maybe you'll get it and you could do this. And so I did, I got the grant. I didn't write a business plan. I moved it, I moved the press to the, the storefront and five years later, I was still there. And it was still this thing of, I had no idea what I was doing, I had no idea what I was getting into, but I made the public commitment to it, mm -hmm. and so then I had to stand up and, 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 and follow through. And that was what happened with the 50 Car Project. Now I've done this, you know, I've stood up, I've made the public commitment to these things, and then I follow through, and it just, you just keep going. And for me, it's always about what is gonna be fun, what is gonna help me grow, what might, what might be a way that I can pull other people along with me, and that is usually what, what, it wasn't what I was thinking with the Peace Corps, but everything else was, how can I pull other people along and do something? It's, it's very funny because the discussion we had before we came up here tonight, uh, like, I, I, a lot of things in my life are not planned. Again, it's like a reactionary kind of thing. Um, and the reactionary is pretty reactive these days. Uh, so I'm of Jewish heritage, both my parents, and I'm not very religious, I'm very proud of my heritage, but I've been hanging out with a lot of different people from many faiths, and I probably learned more about Judaism actually from Archbishop Tutu, with a cross this big around his neck. Um, and one day he really pushed me, and he said, well, what does Judaism mean to you? And I never had to deal with that before, and I was like, I don't know. Um, and all of a sudden I remembered being a kid at the Passover table, um, I didn't really love the other holidays, but I really resonated with Passover. And, um, and I remember hearing for the first time the idea in talking about moving from bondage, moving out of slavery, that as long as anyone anywhere was currently enslaved, no one was free. And in fact, I still get shivers. Like, it, it, it felt like it was in my cells. And a lot of my work has been that. And 
I think it's really informed a lot of my work. Without, it, it's like without thinking about it. It's, it's part of how I'm hardwired. Um, the other thing I just have to say, which is really weird, especially now, um, was I remember, you know when you're a kid and you're growing up and you're learning all this stuff and you're trying to figure it out, but you get to about eight, seven or eight, and you start to trying to figure like how it makes sense for you. And um, Linda was a good friend of my mom's who passed this year. So I remember who my mom was also an incredible artist. Um, and I remember asking her when I was learning about the Holocaust. Because, you know, a good Jew learns since birth, since you're crawling about the Holocaust. Never forget. And um, I remember saying to my mother, good people couldn't have known this was happening, right? Because they would not have let it happen. And my mother burst into tears. She said, Jamie, they knew. I said, no, they couldn't. No, no, no. And I'm feeling that same no, no, no right now with all of us good people if we do not, if we allow what's happening to happen. Our democracy is at stake. All the four freedoms are at stake. This is not just history. This is not just Mr. Rockwell's voice. Mr. Roosevelt's voice, this is up to all of us now. And so there's this charge, and I'm feeling it all. When we jump into the world of either making art or working at a museum and being Im immersed in the art, um, we're not thinking about it being a courageous act. We're not thinking about the consequences at all. We jump in without understanding that it's a dangerous place to be. And only in hindsight do we realize that we had the courage to do it. And I think it's important to remember, to remind ourselves when we're in the midst of it, um, making our stuff, supporting that museum. When we're in the middle of it, to remind ourselves that we are engaged in an act of courage. I just want to thank all of you for being here. It was just a wonderful audience. And, um, and the conversation will continue thanks to the work that you're bringing forward. And um, so.